them for you. I think we must have got you all here then. Okay, well, um, if we're all ready, we'll get started. Um, since we have plenty of time, I was going to start off by telling you something that um, may not at first seem entirely relevant to what we're doing today. But you'll see that, in fact, it raises an extremely interesting question. I am, at the moment, working on a book called um, Before the Sphinx, uh, which is based upon this notion that the Sphinx may have been built as long as 12,500 years ago, rather than the 4,500 years which is generally assumed. You may have seen that television program presented by John Anthony West that went into this same question. West was interested in a notion put forward by a kind of maverick Egyptologist called R.A. Shwala de Lubitsch. Shwala de Lubitsch had always been uh, interested in alchemy and uh, the layout of medieval cathedrals, which he thought provided a key to it. And now he happened to make the very casual suggestion when he was studying uh, temples in Egypt that, in fact, the Sphinx was water-weathered and not weathered by wind and sand. West thought this should be possible to verify or falsify, and uh, finally managed to persuade a geologist from Boston called Robert Schock to go there and look at it. Now, rain weathering is quite different from wind weathering. Wind weathering tends to blow along the side of whatever it is, a cliff, and to slice into it so that it comes out in layers, like a sort of layer cake. Rain weathering also has this effect of making layers, but it also makes channels cut vertically down through it. And this is quite apparent in the Sphinx. What's more, in the Sphinx enclosure, the Sphinx originally was a piece of very hard rock sticking out of the ground. What then happened was that they carved into the ground around the Sphinx, and at a considerable distance from it, finally isolating the Sphinx, whose lower half is made of limestone, in the middle of this. The blocks they cut out from around it, they used to build a temple, the Sphinx temple, in front of it. The curious thing about this, and this is one of the most interesting parts of this mystery, is that for some reason they chose to make the blocks 200 tons each. So there's not only a question of why um, they decided to build with blocks of this size. I mean, the Great Pyramid is built with blocks which on average weigh six tons each, and they're difficult enough to move. We still don't know how they moved blocks of 200 tons. We can imagine why they did it. They felt that building a temple to whatever goddess it was, it would have been an insult to build them of something smaller. Anyway, West became convinced that the Sphinx, in fact, was water-weathered. But if it was water-weathered, when was it water-weathered? There's been no ra rain around in Egypt for thousands of years. Shwala de Lubitsch had said that the Sphinx was built by survivors from Atlantis. And you remember that Plato claimed that Atlantis had sunk in about 9,600 BC, a date that many people thought completely absurd, because at this time civilization was not even supposed to exist. The very earliest cities are 8,000 BC. Now, if it is true that the Sphinx was built as long ago as that, first of all, who built it? Let's assume for a moment the Shuala may have been right and that, you know, maybe survivors from somewhere else moved into Egypt. And this is the old myth. Clearly also, if the um, survivors came from somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, others of them almost certainly went in the opposite direction and landed in South America. And again, this seems to be verified by the fact that there are many of the structures in the jungles of Mexico and in um, 
Tiahuanaco in Bolivia, Peru, that, again, weigh tremendous amounts, absurd amounts. Again, you know, around 200 tons. And we still don't know how they moved them. Now, you may say, what's the relevance of all this? According to Schwaller, what characterized the ancient Egyptians was a peculiar sense of total harmony. He says, every ancient writer who mentioned Egyptian civilization says that the Egyptians were an incredibly happy people. And he is convinced that this was because, in a certain sense, they discovered the secret, so to speak. Their civilization was not discordant in any sense. That in some way, they'd learned to live so completely at harmony that everything outside them, so to speak, reflected this harmony, including, you know, things like the temple at Luxor. Now, for me, here is the challenge. If there was an ancient civilization much older than any that we know of at present, if this civilization had achieved some very high level of harmony, in what exactly did this harmony consist? And, you know, what relevance would it have for us? Because obviously it would be highly desirable if we could learn from it and duplicate it in some way. Schwaller said one very interesting and curious thing in trying to explain his account of how the ancient Egyptians differed from us. Shuala said, if you look intently at the color green and then close your eyes, you will see inside your eyelids a spot of the color red, the complementary color. He says, we would say that the reality is the color green and that the color red that you see inside your head is a kind of illusion. The ancient Egyptians would have said, no, the color you see when you close your eyes is the reality because that is inside you. It's the external world that is in some sense a reflection of that inner reality. Now I think we're beginning to see something very interesting. A completely different approach, so to speak, to the external world. Now, in our case, of course, we may well feel at times a wonderful feeling of harmony with nature. But the fact remains that if you bang your head against a brick cornice, you feel very strongly that the external world is in some way real in its own right and hostile to human beings who don't guide their, themselves properly. Clearly, there's something quite different, according to Schwaller, between Egyptian civilization and modern civilization. And I've set myself the problem in this book of trying to understand just what was going on. There'd be no point in writing such a book if all I wanted to say was that civilization may be 10,000 years older than any of us think. What is so interesting is that if civilization existed at, say, 15,000 BC, which seems possible from Lake Titicata and Tiahuanaco, uh, they've been able to date Tiahuanaco very roughly by the astronomical alignment of its ruins, which seem to show that it was built around about 15,000 BC. If this is true, then certainly such a civilization would have differed from ours fundamentally in one basic respect. It was not, in our sense, a logical, rational civilization. The one thing we are fairly certain of is that this came much, much later with the Greeks and so on, with the later dynasties of the Egyptians. In some way, this was a much more intuitive and instinctive civilization. And I have a feeling that that may somehow contain the clue to moving 200-ton blocks. Don't ask me how. I've got a few ideas, but not in some obvious way, I think, of mind over matter, of four priests standing around and concentrating or something of the sort. This, for me, is the interesting challenge. 
Now, in fact, that is very closely related to what we're going on to discuss. There's an amazing story about Helen Keller, who, as you know, was born blind and deaf. It was told by um, the woman who was more or less a governess. Helen Keller was extremely intelligent, and the governess had succeeded in teaching her the names of things by writing the letters on the palm of her hand. One day, when Helen Keller was only about six, Helen Keller had asked the name of Water, and she'd written Water on the palm of her hand and given her a glass of water. But it seemed obvious that, in a sense, she didn't really make sense of this. Okay, the word Water came, and then she was given a glass of water. Next time, it might be a glass of tea or a glass of milk or something. And, you know, there didn't seem any sense in it, any connection. One morning, after telling her the word for water, as they went out into the yard, she pulled the handle of the pump. And as the water gushed over Helen Keller's hands, once again, wrote the word, word water on the palm of her hand. And suddenly, a look of absolute amazement and delight crossed her face. And she then bent down and touched the ground and wanted to know the name of that. And she wrote ground on her hand and so on. And for the next half hour, she said she ran around like a sort of excited fairy, touching things and demanding their names. She'd quite suddenly seen the connection that everything has a name. <clears throat> and that as soon as you know that everything has a name, there is a sense in which you are beginning to get in charge of that difficult external world. If you've ever seen the look on the face of a baby that has learned for the first time to open a door by dragging down on the handle, this sense of suddenly realizing that you really can do something about this incredibly difficult, and it must be for a baby, Kafkaesque external world, and the realization that you really are in charge, that you can be in charge. <clears throat> now, what's so interesting about that story is that the philosophers for the past hundred years, two hundred years, had been denying that such a thing was possible. John Locke, the English philosopher, said that there is nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses. We learn everything by learning from the external world. That a baby starts with a completely blank screen, a tabula rasa, and then one by one impressions and sensations write upon this screen until little by little you get to know the external world. Now, you can see that this would be totally impossible for Helen Keller. She was blind and deaf. There must have been something in there already, something, so to speak, waiting. And of course, Chomsky's theory of language says very much the same kind of thing, that the way that a child learns language proves that there is already inside the child the disposition um, to be able to handle this extremely complicated business. It's the recognition that inside us, there is already an enormous amount of knowledge which we appear to possess inherently. Our problem is that we find the external world so difficult and complex that we are never quite sure how much knowledge we possess inherently. And yet there are certain moments moments like when Helen Keller felt the water gushing over her hands, when you experience a flash of exultation and suddenly know that you are in charge. It's as if human freedom were normally invisible, like a candle flame in the sunlight. But if you put your finger in the candle flame, it burns you all right. And that there are certain times in these moments of freedom in these moments when you sense that things are going your way, when you sort of have that feeling, you know, five down, five still to go, that curious feeling of triumph, the feeling that you can do it, that quite suddenly the candle flame turns into something like a magnesium flare, and you experience this curious sense of inner power and certainty. What we are talking about is an inner world, a total world, which is already there. <clears throat> 
Now, this was one of the most basic ideas of Rudolf Steiner. Steiner said, the inner world is the spirit world. Now, when I first started to read Steiner, I found this assertion almost incomprehensible. What did he mean? You know, spirits, uh, ghosts, and all the rest of it. What's that got to do with sinking inside yourself? Steiner even went on to say that the inner world is the same thing as the world of geometry. That if you become fascinated by geometry, you are forced to withdraw into yourself, which is to withdraw into the spirit world. At first, I found this immensely puzzling. And then gradually began to see just what he meant. To begin with, do you remember the story of Arthur Kersler when Kersler was in a Spanish jail and likely to be executed as a communist? And that a number of people had been executed and he knew he was likely to be the next on the list. And sitting around in his cell, he tried to remember Pythagoras's proof that there is no greatest prime number. You know that a prime is a number that can't be divided evenly by any other number. Like seven, for example, there's no way of dividing it except leaving one over. Pythagoras proved it, produced an interesting proof that primes, there must be an infinite number of primes. What he said was, imagine there is some prime, which is, in fact, the greatest of all possible primes, and beyond that, there are no primes at all. Now, imagine multiplying together every number before that prime, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, right up to that prime, which may be, you know, billion, 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 billion. And when you have finally arrived at that number, add 1 to it. <laughs> and you've once again got an even bigger prime. And you continue doing that indefinitely. And Kersler said, as he was scratching on the wall of his cell, trying to remember this proof of Pythagoras, and it suddenly came to him, quite suddenly he went into exactly the same kind of ecstasy as Helen Keller with the water. He said an overwhelming feeling of sheer delight and happiness came over him. The realization that the human mind was able to say something about infinity and say it with absolute certainty. And he said quite suddenly he went into a state of silent ecstasy. He said something like drifting down a river of peace under bridges of silence. Then he found that something was nagging him at the back of his mind. I thought, what is it? Then thought, oh yes, of course, I'm likely to be shot this morning. <laughs> How trivial, who cares? <laughs> now, this is what Steiner was talking about. Steiner seemed to have had a curious ability to become so fascinated by whatever he was doing or thinking about, that like Arthur Kersler, he was able to withdraw totally inside himself into a kind of completely silent space. And once this enormous silence had descended upon him, he was able to move around quite freely in this inner world. That, that's what it's all about. If we could all do this at this moment, withdraw more and more and more deeply into that inner silence, we would all quite suddenly become capable of just a few of our enormous possibilities. The possibilities of which most of us remain ignorant throughout our lives. I suddenly saw very clearly the implications of this one day when I was driving with my children back from some holiday spot and I was talking to them about some ideas and it suddenly struck me that there was I driving the car sort of perfectly competently. I wasn't driving mechanically. I was observing what I was doing and you know paying attention but at the same time I was talking to them and enjoying what I was saying. I was living on two levels at the same time. It suddenly struck me that this is the 
peculiar human capability to live in two streams of consciousness at the same time and that the really important one is the second stream that stream of ideas that stream of something inside you which you focus with deep interest this in fact you know is of tremendous value in ordinary everyday life have you ever been feeling rather sick and thinking oh god I'm not going to vomit here am I <laughs> and then suddenly something interesting occurs to you or somebody says something that grabs your attention and quite suddenly everything is fine the sickness has gone when the two streams get tangled up together like that it completely screws you up you're operating at 50 percent of your proper efficiency in order to operate properly the two streams need to be separate and running as two streams parallel to one another this is what happens in all of these moments that we've been speaking of T Lawrence describes in seven pillars of wisdom how they got up very early one morning he says um, rose um, before the intellect had had a chance to start doing its work of muddying the water he said and had a sort of feeling of that feeling of brilliant clarity and happiness as they were riding along and obviously this feeling of total clarity total happiness suddenly gives you a glimpse of something that human beings are capable of at any time but which tends to happen only accidentally with us what had happened quite clearly he says that it was while the intellect was still abed when the senses wake up with the sun while the intellect is still abed in other words a part of himself was still there asleep so to speak the other part of himself was able to separate and the second stream was able to continue completely separately from the normal stream of his existence from actually riding along on a camel it suddenly struck me that this is one of the most important realizations that I've ever had this is the answer we were intended to have two completely distinct streams of consciousness you remember I'm always quoting this Proust describing the way that he tasted a little cake dipped in tea when he was feeling terribly low and miserable after a hard day and that quite suddenly he experienced a curious feeling of sheer happiness as he tasted it he said I had ceased to feel mediocre accidental mortal and he dipped the cake in the tea again and tasted it again to try to see why he felt so ecstatically happy and then quite suddenly remembered that when he was a child in a little town called Combray when they returned from the Sunday afternoon walk his aunt Leonie used to give him the same kind of cake dipped in the same kind of herb tea and that the combination had suddenly brought back to him with tremendous clarity the reality of his childhood a moment before he could have said yes I was a child in Combray but in a sense he wouldn't have meant it now quite suddenly the taste of the cake dipped in tea had carried him back inside himself into a sort of enormous cave inside himself and as soon as he was inside that cave a feeling of total happiness and freedom the two streams had separated now you know that Proust spent the rest of his life writing this enormous novel remembrance of things past in which he attempted to revive that tremendous feeling of happiness that he'd experienced he thought that if he could focus upon some incident in his own past with sufficient um, care and precision 
he would actually succeed once again in entering that strange inner world and experiencing once again this strange feeling of ceasing to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. He has about three or four occasions in the book in which he describes similar experiences that did come completely out of the blue, but he never learned the trick of inducing it at will. I mean, fortunately, he wrote this enormous novel in the, in the process, but he never learned it. Why didn't he learn it? Obviously, because he was following the wrong lead. He imagined that what he was trying to do was to revive his own past with total reality, and so he tried thinking about it uh, in the greatest detail that he possibly could. But obviously, if you try to think about something that happened to you 20 years ago, you don't really think about it. You may write about it, but even so, you're falsifying it to a large extent. You're just not going in the right direction. Now, in fact, as you know, a brain physiologist called Wilder Penfield actually discovered Proust's secret. Penfield um, was performing a brain operation and he happened to touch the temporal cortex of the brain with his electric probe. And the patient who was awake, because the brain has no nerves, so you can do these operations with the patient awake, and in fact you need to in order to know precisely what you're doing, um, the patient quite suddenly recollected with tremendous total clarity some event that had happened in childhood. There he was back in his kitchen at the age of 10, could hear precisely what his mother said that morning, could smell this sort of cooking smells, could hear dogs barking out in the street, everything totally real, as if it had all been filmed on videotape and was now being played back in 3D. Penfield discovered that, in fact, you could do this um, at any time by touching the temporal cortex. The um, scenes that came back were quite arbitrary, but they were always totally detailed, and the person really, literally went back into his past. So if Proust had known Wilder Penfield, he would have found a much simpler way of doing this than writing an enormous novel. Now, the interesting thing about this is that Penfield noted something curious. He had always assumed that consciousness is merely a product of the brain, and that, therefore, there is a sense in which, when you are conscious of something, there should only be one single stream of consciousness. And yet here was his patient sitting saying, my God, yes, I'm in my kitchen and I'm 10 years old and so on. And yet at the same time was fully aware of Penfield and the room in which he was sitting. Two streams of consciousness were flowing simultaneously. Which made Penfield suddenly realize that he was totally wrong about consciousness. It could not be a product of the brain. Consciousness must exist in some sense quite separately. What Penfield really meant was that streams of consciousness ought to blend and mix, you know, like those taps where you turn on the hot and cold and the mixture of it comes out of the tap in the middle. In point of fact, what he realized was that consciousness has two taps. You can get hot water out of one and cold water out of the other. Now, this, you can see, is exactly like the recognition that comes from Helen Keller's experience. Locke had said, there is nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses. We are entirely dependent upon the external physical world. That shapes us, that makes us what we are. And apart from that, we are nothing, absolutely nothing. And clearly it was untrue. What showed Penfield that there are two streams was the fact that his patient was sitting wide awake, able to talk to him and describe what he was seeing. While it was happening. While it was happening. My God, here is my mother, here am I sitting in my kitchen, and yet knowing fully consciously that he was sitting there in that physical room talking to Penfield. So it's not like you could say he went back and forth in an instantaneous second between the two streams. You could really say the two streams were parallel. The two streams are absolutely parallel. He was aware of the two things happening at the same time. Yeah? 
<laughs> this in theory is possible. In fact, we human beings, in my observation, um, seldom experience more than two at the same time. There's no reason why not. In fact, this is something that I call duo consciousness. Um, when you were stuck in a room, feeling rather bored and low, you were in mono consciousness. The moment you were suddenly reminded of some other time, think of a child sitting by the fire on Christmas Eve, listening to a ghost story, and also listening to the snow pattering against the windows. He's so happy because he's in two places at once. He is sitting there in front of a warm fire, listening to a slightly frightening story, and at the same time is aware that out there there's a lot of cold and snow, and he's as conscious of the reality of the cold and the snow as he is of the warmth of the fire in the room. He is in two realities at once, and when you are in two realities at once, you are happy. Happiness is duo consciousness. Now, there is no reason in theory why you shouldn't have trio consciousness, quadruple consciousness. Wasn't there a time in the situation that the mind had an integration between three and the sensation is So I, I'm not really hearing you properly because of the fan and... Uh, I say, isn't there a kind of integration at the part of the mind so that the, the, the different streams of become one consciousness and the other one becomes one reality? Um, indeed. You can see that when the child is sitting in front of the fire, um, there is an integration. He does genuinely have a, a duo sense at the same time of that reality out there and that reality here in the room. And what's more, the mind straddles them as effortlessly as you can walk with one foot on the in the gutter and one foot on the pavement, because you've got two legs. Somehow the mind has got two legs. <laughs> this is the interesting thing. It may, for all I know, have as many legs as a centipede. <laughs> And there's no reason why, in other words, we shouldn't, shouldn't experience multiple consciousness. But at the moment, duo consciousness is the best we can do. Uh, why would it follow, why would Penfield feel that he was wrong in feeling that consciousness was a product of the brain? Why couldn't both these genes of consciousness be the product of the brain? Well, simply on the analogy of the tap producing water. If you imagine that the water was the product of the tap, in some way, rather than coming from a reservoir outside the tap. You would be rather surprised if suddenly the tap began gushing hot and cold water simultaneously, either coming out of both sides of the tap, or at least it would prove there was something very strange and complex about the tap. What he was saying was that there is something very strange and complex about consciousness. I quite agree, if you wanted to, it would be possible to, as it were, reduce it someone like J.B. Watson, who said that he'd never in his laboratory observed such a thing as consciousness, <laughs> it might well have uh, take, taken this point of view. And what has been happening, of course, is that for more than 200 years, ever since Locke and Hume, science and psychology have moved along this route. Now, this, in fact, <coughs> brings us back to Steiner. Because Steiner was brought up, he was born in 1861, son of a station master in Austria, brought up in a beautiful district of country and woods and mountains, and from a very early age found that he had this strange ability just to sink into conditions of pure ecstasy, <coughs> looking around at nature, a bit like Wordsworth. This is why he came to realize that somehow and um, there was a world inside himself into which he could, at certain times, sink completely and totally. Now, there was something else rather odd about Steiner. One day when he was in the station waiting room, a woman walked into the room whom he vaguely seemed to recognize because she looked so like his parents. Then she walked into the stove and disappeared. Later that day, he heard, in fact, that the his aunt had committed suicide in some distant place. Um, he was convinced, and I'm convinced too, that what he'd seen was the spirit of the dead aunt. Steiner always had this curious ability, many people do have it for some odd reason, to, so to speak, see the dead. But what he later claimed was that when, uh, for example, some friend of his disappeared, he was able, by moving deep inside himself, 
to find out exactly what had happened to him. The, in this inner world of silence, he was able, so to speak, to know things which we cannot normally know in a physical sense. What I'm getting at is this. These curious abilities, the ability to turn on the two streams at the same time and to keep them separate, not to screw yourself up by allowing them to mix, this ability appears to touch unknown powers inside us, powers that we possess perfectly normally. Now, Uspensky had precisely this same curious ability as a child. He and his sister used to sit on the windowsill looking down at the street and prophesy to one another what was going to happen. A red carriage is going to come around the corner. And they were almost always right. When Uspensky went with his mother for the first time to school as a five or six year old and his mother got lost, Uspensky said, if you go down that corridor there and down that flight of steps, you'll find the headmaster's room. He'd never been in it before. Again and again, he experienced this sense of knowing places that he'd never been to. You know, the sense of, I've been here before. When later he read Nietzsche on what Nietzsche calls eternal recurrence, the notion that our physical life is somehow an illusion which gets repeated over and over and over again, a bit like the same movie being shown in the movie cinema again and again and again and again in the course of a week. He became convinced that this was the answer to these curious glimpses, that he had lived all these things once before. And I suppose this could be the explanation. Certainly, we do have a strong sense that there's something curiously unreal about the external world when things like this happen to us. A friend of mine, a musician, came back from a concert in London very late at night, was sitting in a taxi driving along the Bayswater Road, when he suddenly knew with absolute certainty that the Queensway traffic light, another taxi would try to jump the light and would hit their taxi sideways on. He thought, shall I tell the driver? Well, he'd obviously think I was completely mad. And in fact, at the Queensway, another taxi tried to jump the light and hit their taxi sideways on. Now, there is no normal way in which you can explain something like that. You might, for example, say, well, what about telepathy? Suppose, in fact, he had telepathic knowledge that the driver was coming up Queensway. That's okay, but how would he have telepathic knowledge that the driver would decide to try and jump the lights when the driver himself didn't know at that point? That's um, extremely interesting, but th there are other cases in which this does not appear to be true. In other words, in which a person could avoid this happening. Uh, the case quoted by J.B. Ryan, a woman had an extremely clear dream about being on a camping holiday, of going back to the tent for the soap and leaving her baby at the side of the stream for a moment. She was going to do some washing. When she came back, the baby was in the stream, face downwards and drowned. When, several months later, on a real camping holiday, uh, she was about to go back to the tent to get the soap, she suddenly remembered the dream and tucked the baby under her arm and went back to the tent. Um, she was pretty sure later that this was a premonitory dream and that its purpose was to make her do something else. Well, if, if I had been on a fish, I, I would have really damned me. Yeah. <laughs> I just couldn't get that, <laughs> that Yep, I think you've got a point. There is, in fact, um, another case which I quote in the book Beyond the Occult, in which someone had an extremely clear vision 
um, a music teacher while he was teaching music, just quite suddenly looking over the pupil's shoulder, saw a particular bend on the road home and a car coming around the bend at far too great a speed and hitting him head on. He totally forgot about this until he was actually near the bend on the way home. Suddenly remembered this and quickly, like you, pulled into the side of the road. The car came around the corner on the wrong side but missed him. So what I'm trying to say is that what these premonitory experiences appear to show us is that somewhere deep down inside us, we know all kinds of curious things. And what's more, these, this knowledge is intended, so to speak, to be protective in order that you can do something useful and purposeful with your life rather than being subject to stupid accidents. Um, another theory is that there are spirit beings who are trying to help us by communicating it. It's not, it's not necessarily uh, us, but some other beings that are doing that. Yep, I would accept the spirit hypothesis too. In fact, you know, I would accept it to a very large extent because one thing that did become fairly clear to me when I wrote a book about the poltergeist which was based upon the notion usually held by psychical researchers that the poltergeist is in fact unconscious energy of a disturbed adolescent which somehow gets free and wrecks the joint and realized when I talked to some girl in Pontefract who described the poltergeist which was throwing her out of bed again and again and again tossing the sheets across the room and then finally described to me the way that the poltergeist had dragged her upstairs by her throat face down, and I suddenly knew with absolute certainty that was not her own mind doing it. That was a spiritual right. And from then on, I've accepted completely this notion that an enormous amount of this kind of thing happens through people who do not know that they're dead, earthbound spirits. But... Um, <laughs> yes, and this again is a fascinating business. Uh, that you must have noticed the way that when you're feeling good, interesting synchronicities occur, helpful synchronicities. And when you're feeling sort of awful, this is the time when they do not happen, as if somehow you've tuned in to some deeper level. Um, I told you uh, my favorite story of this, I think, last time I was here, that... Um, I was trying to write a volume of un about unsolved mysteries, an encyclopedia. I had to make up my mind whether I would write the next article about Joan of Arc or about synchronicity. At this point, looking around for some stuff on Joan of Arc, I opened a volume of Edgar Allan Poe, and the mystery of Marie Roger said, there are some coincidences which are so extraordinary that they make a hair prickle and realize they cannot be coincidences. So I realized I was being told to go ahead with the article about synchronicity. As soon as I went ahead with the article about synchronicity, the most preposterous synchronicities began to occur the whole time. <laughs> As if something was saying, OK, you're going in the right direction. Keep going. Now, the most absurd of these synchronicities was this. Um, a friend of mine called Jacques Vallée, who is interested in UFOs, had at some point got tremendously interested in a peculiar cult in Los Angeles called the cult of Melchizedek, who was a very obscure biblical prophet. And um, he tried to find out all he could about Melchizedek without very much success because there's almost nothing about him. So um, one day on the way to Los Angeles International Airport, he asked his lady taxi driver for a receipt. And the lady taxi driver signed it M. Melchizedek. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, there must be more Melchizedeks around than I thought. <laughs> he then looked in the Los Angeles telephone directory, which, as you know, is this size. There was one Melchizedek, his taxi driver, <laughs> in the whole thing. And he thought, it's as if you put a notice on some universal notice board, wanted Melchizedeks. <clears throat> How about this? No, no, that's no good. That's a taxi driver. <laughs> 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 No. <laughs> 
I just told this story about Jacques Vallée in my article, which is there in the encyclopedia. You can read it. And it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It was time to take my dogs for a walk. So I got up, prepared to go upstairs because I work in a basement room. And I noticed that on my camp bed, which is there in theory in case I feel tired and need a rest at mid-afternoon, but which is in practice so piled high with books that it would take me 20 minutes to clear it to lie down, I noticed there was a book which I hadn't seen before and which had obviously fallen off the shelf. It was a thing called um, You Are Sentenced to Life by some Los Angeles doctor. And I'd actually sent it away for binding and written inside it the date I'd bought it in Los Angeles. I went upstairs and tossed it into my armchair went out for my walk and came back from my walk, opened this book, and the first thing I saw myself looking at was a back page headed Cult of Melchizedek. This was a letter from a lady called Grace Hooper Pettifer, who, who had founded the Cult of Mel Melchizedek, writing to the author of the book. And I rushed downstairs to my typewriter and started, you're not going to believe this, but <laughs> it was as if having quoted the most preposterous synchronicity I could think of, Fate had said, I'll go one better, just to prove to you that I really do exist. Now, it is my own experience that once I can get myself into these curious states in which suddenly I know that everything is okay, in some strange way, um, I seem to float along happily. Interesting things happen, I come across things that I need to know, and so on. But I must get myself into this state if I'm feeling a little tired, a little hungover, a little tense, then somehow, you know, it just does not happen. We need to get into this deeper state. And this deeper state is basically, as I said earlier, duo consciousness. There's an interesting story about the playwright Strindberg. Strindberg was sitting in a cafe talking to a friend who was about to do something which Strindberg thought would be silly and dangerous. And he was trying to dissuade the friend by reminding him of a conversation they'd had six months ago in another cafe on the other side of Stockholm. And he was saying, do you remember that time when we were sitting in the Augustina Cafe on the other side and, you know, you remember the little place with the sort of co copper kettle and all the rest of it? As he was speaking, quite suddenly he found that he was sitting in two cafes at once. He was sitting in the present cafe, watching his friend and the people around him. He was also sitting in the Augustina cafe, and there was a door where in this present cafe there was just a blank wall, and people were coming in through that door and walking down the steps and into the place. And he's suddenly so fascinated by this weird experience that he just sat staring blankly. Now clearly what he should have done was to rush straight over to the Augustina cafe and see whether those people he'd seen coming in through the door were really there, and I'm pretty sure they would have been. But his friend said, he suddenly found his friend staring at him with horror. And he said, what's the matter? And his friend said, for God's sake, never do that again. You, you look as if you died. But obviously what had happened, he was so in, uh, incredulous staring at all this that he'd gone into a strange condition of blankness, living in two worlds at the same time. This is what frightened the friend. Is, it, is dual consciousness what started with Or what was he pointing? No, of course. The moment you descend inside yourself, you have descended into the second stream. And as soon as you are in the second stream, I mean, you're in the first stream anyway, aren't you? Because you're here, you know, you're, you're living in the ordinary physical world. It's when, but the interesting thing about the second stream is that when you descend into the second stream, the first thing that happens is that a curious sense of relaxation comes over you. And when that sense of relaxation comes over you, oddly enough, also a sensation of power, of being able to do. A racing driver, I'm convinced, driving at 200 miles an hour, is in the second stream. Somehow there are two levels of him. And it's the second stream that somehow makes him know that he's not going to have an accident. When, on the other hand, you know, he just feels sort of over tense and all the rest of him can't get into that second stream, it suddenly becomes possible that he can have an accident. In other words, we have some control over the physical world and what happens to us in some strange way. Now, this appears to me to be obviously <clears throat> and basically true. This is something of which I remain aware a great deal of the time. That in some sense, 
this outer world, which appears to be so normal and logical and solid, is not quite what it seems. The mind interacts with it in such a way that we have control over it through the mind. Now, if that is true, what do we have to do in order to increase that control? Proust tried writing an enormous novel, but clearly he hadn't got the right solution. You can see that the right solution is the one that we've been speaking about. If you can learn to withdraw inside yourself, there suddenly comes a point of relaxation in which you have a sense of guiding yourself, so to speak, being in charge like a racing driver. And it's that moment when quite suddenly you are able to do this, to move deeper into yourself, or less so if you feel so inclined. In fact, as you know, the black room, which is used in many universities um, for experiments in sensory deprivation, actually enables students to descend to this deep level simply by taking away every possible sound. In total blackness, total soundlessness, students find they descend deeper inside themselves, going to a state of sort of blissful focus. And once they are in this state of blissful focus, can suddenly remember all of the work that they've done over the past semester and conjure it up. Bring it, as it were, to the forefront of the mind and prepare themselves for the exam. Unfortunately, this works only for a short time. If they stay too long in the black room, um, the, the first thing that happens is they fall asleep, sometimes for 14 or 15 hours. When they wake up, they're in this superb state in which they can remember all kinds of things, have access to all kinds of things in the mind. And then, suddenly, they begin to get bored. They want to get back to the ordinary physical world. And if you leave them in there too long, um, you destroy the mind. This, the Russians were using it for brainwashing. Someone left in the black room too long goes totally insane. It's the same kind of thing. Transcendental meditation, um, all kinds of meditation are doing very much the same kind of thing, um, retreating inside oneself. But what I'm trying to say is this. Meditation techniques are very interesting, but most people find them quite difficult simply because told to sit and meditate, told to make your mind a blank or whatever it is, they find it extremely difficult to do. This is the very time when all kinds of irrelevant thoughts begin to rush through the mind. And yet, when you are naturally in this state, it seems that you know precisely where you're going as if you're going along a country road and you know the way. You take the first left and the second right and so on. It's an extremely detailed knowledge of what to do when you get into these states. Now, what I'm suggesting is that there is no reason why we should not learn that extremely detailed way of getting into these states. Knowledge is far more important than you know, intuition or feeling or meditation or anything else. The absolutely purely straightforward scientific and philosophical knowledge of just what you are doing is the important thing, which is why I spend so much of my time merely thinking about these things instead of bothering to put them into practice. I've actually reached the stage where I can have what Maslow calls peak experiences with a sort of fairly small amount of effort, and particularly in bed at night. That, by the way, is an interesting technique. You know that if you're in bed on a winter morning and you've got to get up in five minutes, quite suddenly the bed seems so beautifully warm and womb-like. And if you try to repeat this experience on a Sunday when you can stay in bed all morning, it doesn't work. Now, think why that is so. When you're in bed on the weekday and you've got to get up in five minutes, you now determine that you are going to appreciate the bed for the five minutes you were in it. You tell all your thoughts and feelings, shut up, I'm going to just enjoy the warmth. And somehow, just this focusing of attention upon where you are at the present moment, this attentiveness is what actually does it. Now, if you try doing this in bed at night, particularly, you know, if you have to get out of bed to go to the toilet or something, 
to quite deliberately get back into bed, turn on this attentiveness, it works in the middle of the night. You can suddenly go into this blissful state that you get on a winter morning when you've got to get out of bed in five minutes. Quite suddenly, the bed becomes the most intensely desirable place in the world. You've gone into what Uspensky calls self-remembering, and I find that this becomes very easy to do. That I can wake up a dozen times in the night, and each time go into this blissful state of, God, aren't I lucky to be here, which of course sweeps you straight back into sleep. It's worth, worth doing this. Is that, is that then not very similar to John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness, where you're mindful of the very moment you're in now, and that's what you're really trying to achieve? That is exactly what it is, the Buddha's mindfulness in point of fact. I cited last night this story of the Zen master Ikkyu, when, when a workman said, will you write something on my tablet? And he wrote, attention. And the workman said, oh, come on, that's not very significant. Write something else. And he wrote, attention, attention. The workman said, oh, come on. He wrote, attention, attention, attention. The workman said, what does attention mean? He said, attention means attention. <laughs> And then you come out of it and you're in the relative world and you do mm. your actions. So by continually going back from the atom to the absolute and into the, the, the relative, you achieve a state of passive consciousness that begins with this world. But I got the feeling that the second stream was not the stream as you described it, but it's sort of That's more right. of an empty, uh, nirvana yeah. uh, sort of type thing. Now, on the other hand, you know what I mean? But, but you're describing that second stream differently. Totally differently. I'm not talking about the same thing at all. Um, I was told of an extremely interesting story concerning that by a friend of mine called Joyce Collins Smith, who was one of the first people in England to um, go along to see the Maharishi when he came to England. She queued up in an Oxford hotel and with a flower. You were supposed to take the Maharishi a flower. <laughs> when she got to the Maharishi, he took the flower from her kindly touched her on the forehead and said, okay, go and sit down over there and meditate. And as he touched her on the forehead, she went into a state of totally blissful peace. She went and sat in the corner of the room looking at the traffic going past in the street in a state of such deep peace that everything she looked at was completely fascinating. And after several hours, she suddenly looked at her watch and thought, oh my God, I'm supposed to be home to cook my husband's dinner, and leapt to her feet, but found that from then on she could go into this state of deep peace at will. The Maharishi had ev evidently done this, and she'd gone into the basic state of transcendental meditation. Now, this, she soon discovered, had its disadvantages. First of all, she noticed that a lot of the people with her um, in the Maharishi's group, which she then joined, were spending so much time in this blissful state that they did not want to come back to the normal world. They didn't want to come back to the world in which they had to cope. They were spending more and more time in this state until like the romantics of the 19th century with their moods of ecstasy, um, they were beginning to go to pieces. And suddenly she realized what was happening when it began to happen to her. She was going into such curious states of deep bliss that her mind was able to see all kinds of things that normally go past as much too fast for us to notice. So that, for example, she found, I think she said for the first time, um, looking at a baby and suddenly realizing with great clarity what that baby would be like in 20 years' time, and then 40 years' time, and then 60 years' time. And then from then on, this faculty began to operate all the time. She couldn't look at anything without suddenly seeing its beginning, its middle, and its end. She would see, let's say, a chair. She would see the chair as the wood in the original tree, at the same time as the chair as carved by the carpenter, and then as a pile of old firewood, good for nothing but starting the fire. And this became so horrific that this, it was like standing on a, an ice slide and just skidding every time you looked at anything, that she finally couldn't stand it any longer and decided to commit suicide. <coughs> so she took a rope and went out into the back garden, and she'd thrown the rope over a tree when she suddenly realized something interesting. The rope was standing still. She wasn't seeing it as a a lot of hemp and then as a rope and then as a piece of dirty, twisted old rope. 
it was holding still. And she realized that because she was thinking of committing suicide, something inside her had gone sort of, Ugh! and that made the rope stand still. And from then on, of course, she didn't commit suicide. She knew how to do it. All she had to do was to focus with that total intensity. Ugh! And as soon as she did that, everything was fine. Yep, that. Was it time that people went on these long retreats and did spend many hours doing it? They said, oh, but yes, he did devise it in this way because he thought this was the best way to work Western. But then there's another interesting point to make here. The Maharishi was himself subject to this same problem. Joyce soon began to notice that he was not able to keep these two realms separate. At first, he was very good at it. He was very good at, you know, um, his business of meditation and then at the same time remaining in the world and handling the world. But as the Beatles became fans of his, and quite suddenly he was overwhelmed, you know, by money, admiration, and all the rest of it, Joyce began to feel that he was steadily becoming corrupt. And finally, she left the movement because she suddenly felt that what he had been when she first knew him, he no longer was. It clearly was not his fault. It's just something absolutely basic about the way that if you get too involved with the world, it drags you, whether you like it or not, in a direction you don't want to go. So, you know, if this is true of the Maharishi, it's true for all of us to a large extent. Now, what I'm trying to say, though, is that I do believe there are alternatives to this. I've never been a tremendous admirer of the Eastern way of thought. When I was a teenager and discovered the Bhagavad Gita, I found this a tremendous revelation. You know, a sort of miserable, irritable, inefficient teenager loathing the world and always saying and doing the wrong thing and tripping over carpets and, and so on. And then quite suddenly with the Bhagavad Gita and the recognition that what you did was to sit down, withdraw into, your, into yourself, focus your attention totally and completely, and then repeat, Brahman is the ritual, Brahman is the offering, Brahman is he who offers to the fire that is Brahman, an increasing feeling of deep peace. This, it seemed to me, was basically the answer. And yet, at the end of my teens, as I found, you know, that I had to make a living, go to London, I got married because my wife was pregnant and so on. Quite suddenly, this was no longer any kind of answer at all. What I did find is that as I became more absorbed in this problem of how you lived simultaneously in the real world, and also in this world which I so greatly preferred of ideas, of thoughts, the necessity to somehow balance these two gradually made me aware of this whole problem which I came to call the outsider problem. And the outsider problem is simply that problem of two worlds. I said once, man is a planet of a double star. And this terrific gravity of the external world pulls you in one direction. And this equally terrific gravity of our need to move into our internal world pulls us in the opposite direction. And meanwhile, in between these two, we feel as if we're being torn apart. And yet, you know, it was by thinking about it in purely Western terms that I gradually began to get on top of the problem. And then I wrote The Outsider when I was 23, and it came out when I was 24, and, um, you know, in a certain sense solved the problem, at least, of how to make a living. And uh, from that point onwards, I saw that, in a sense, the Western way is, for someone like myself, basically the only way a few years ago, I had to go to uh, the anniversary of a Japanese esoteric Buddhism monastery and had an opportunity to study esoteric Buddhism at fairly close quarters for about a week under interesting conditions and realized that <clears throat> the basically there's a sense in which I detest Buddhism. 
with his basic dislike of the physical world and of the human world. Do you remember the basic story is that the Buddha was brought up by his parents never to realize there was any evil in the world. And one day, out walking with his tutor, he saw a very old man wandering along the street, poking with his stick at the ground. He said, what's the matter with him? And he said, oh, he's old, happens to all of us. The next day, he saw a very sick man in the street and said, what's the matter with him? And he said, oh, he's sick, happens to all of us. And the next day, they saw a funeral. And he said, what's the matter with him? And he said, oh, he's just dead. It happens to all of us. And the Buddha suddenly realized there's something basically wrong with human existence. And if we're going to control it in some way, we've got to withdraw completely from all this world of illusion and look at it from a completely detached point of view. Now, this at this time seemed to me to be a tremendous message. Certainly helped me, you know, get over all of these adolescent problems. But I also found that my greatest moments were sudden moments of absolutely pure exaltation, a tremendous overwhelming feeling of inner certainty and strength in which everything seemed good, in which there was no question at all, even of a dead man being something undesirable. And suddenly I began to see that the real basic synthesis is a kind of Hegelian synthesis in which you could rise totally up into what I call the bird's eye point of view rather than the worm's eye point of view in which we're stuck for 99% of the time. And it was this recognition of the reality of the bird's eye point of view and that you can achieve it that began to become the basic focus of all my thinking. For example, I think that what happened to Uspensky when he was able to tell who was coming around the corner in the street, what happened to my friend as he was driving along the Bayswater Road, was almost certain, certainly a flash of the bird's eye point of view in which you see something from overhead. How it is done, I don't know. You know, there are two twins in a New York hospital who can sit exchanging prime numbers, huge prime numbers, 10-digit, 20-digit prime numbers. Now, this should be an impossibility. If a prime number is big, there's no way of finding whether it's a prime except by dividing every smaller number into it until you are halfway through. A computer even takes, you know, a matter of minutes to discover whether a very big number is a prime. And yet here are these two twins in the New York hospital. One of them will say something like 220,787,000,000. The other one will smile and then say 587,734,000,000 or something like that. And so it goes on. They just sit swapping prime numbers all the time. Now, how do they do it? Even a computer can't do it. Clearly, what is happening in some weird way is they're getting up above the whole number field like an eagle and spotting prime numbers enormous distances apart. It's completely absurd. These same twins, if someone knocks a box of matches over the table, can count the matches while they're falling to the floor and say, you know, there are 97 matches there. Sorry? I can't hear you. Are they idiot savants? Yes, yeah. Yeah, idiot savants, yeah. Could you comment on remote viewing as a possibility of getting outside and seeing the world? Would I? Comment on remote viewing as a possible Remote viewing, um, as practiced by people like Ingo Swan. Um, no, I'm not so sure. This appears to be um, some kind of um, projection allied to astral projection. Um, but of a part of the mind. I don't frankly understand exactly what's involved. Hmm. But he does bring to mind this interesting business of the Glastonbury monks. Do you remember the story that a man called Frederick Bly Bond was asked um, to help to um, excavate the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey. A friend of his appeared to be able to do automatic writing, so he and the friend sat together and he proceeded to ask questions about Glastonbury Abbey. And somebody who claimed to be a monk from the remote past proceeded to take his hand and get him to actually write things about the Abbey. They then went away and excavated where the monk had indicated, and they found that in every single case they were quite right. There, buried under the turf, you know, was a chapel of precisely that dimension and so on. 
What is interesting is that this monk, who was communicating to Bly Bond, um, said that it wasn't, he wasn't a ghost, that it was a part of himself which somehow had clung to these premises where he'd lived, but which, not, which was not in a certain sense a living person. Now that to me, frankly, doesn't make sense. I can't see the distinction between a ghost and a memory clinging to a place which can still communicate and answer questions. So it does appear that here we're moving into a field, you know, that I don't even begin to understand, that the remote viewing is obviously connected with exactly the same thing. Now to get back to this question we were speaking of earlier, it does seem that the answer to a large extent lies in getting inside yourself and learning that trick of sinking through various layers into a kind of inner stillness. And doing this completely deliberately and consciously. Now, I said a moment ago that the opposite also seems to me to be extremely significant. The moment of sudden total exaltation. And here I'm afraid, Morris, is where I tell my famous Graham Greene story. But nevertheless, it seems to me a story of such importance that it would be impossible to overestimate its importance. You remember that the novelist Graham Greene, when he was a child, was at a school in which his father was the headmaster at Berkhamstead. Uh, at some point, he was sent along to see a psychiatrist because he didn't enjoy games and all the rest of it. Staying in the house of the psychiatrist and being psychoanalyzed, he found such an intensely pleasant experience, you know, someone's full attention directed on him and, as it were, boosting his ego, that in no time at all he was cured of his dislike of games. He said the main trouble with this was that being cured left him in a state of total boredom. He said one characteristic of this state was that he would look at a scene which he could see was visually beautiful and would feel nothing whatsoever, just dead inside. And that this feeling of deadness and greyness persisted all the time, whatever he was doing. An underlying feeling of hopelessness and futility. And that at this point he discovered in a corner cupboard a revolver belonging to his elder brother, took it out on the Berkhamstead Common and played Russian roulette. He inserted a bullet into the chambers spun the chambers, pointed at his head, and then pulled the trigger. And when there was just a click, he looked down the chambers and saw the bullet had now come into position, so he'd missed death by just one. And he said he felt an overwhelming sense of sheer happiness and ecstasy. He said it was as if a light had been turned on, and I suddenly saw that all human life is infinitely beautiful. Now, this intensity is obviously an extremely interesting mechanism because think what had happened. Green is in a state of exhaustion and boredom, a state in which it does not seem that any effort is worth making. He decides to play Russian roulette. When he pulls the trigger, his whole being suddenly wakes up at the thought he is about to die or could be about to die and his whole being goes, Aah! then there's just a click, and he goes, Phew! and it's in that Phew! that he suddenly sees everything as intensely beautiful. So the basic mechanism in dealing with boredom is first of all, this tremendous, Ugh! quite deliberately concentrating your mind and then allowing the relaxation to follow. And when one follows the other, you suddenly shoot into this state that Maslow called the peak experience, in which you see everything as incredibly beautiful and, you know, incredibly meaningful. Now, you could say that what has happened is simply that playing Russian roulette had really focused his attention. And that is true. But the focusing had occurred through that. This is the basic mechanism of the focusing. Now, it should be possible to do that without 
playing Russian roulette, <laughs> which is a dangerous way of doing it. Sorry, Morris. Couldn't we say that that's a kind of cleansing of the doors of perception? He's, he's energizing his perceptions. Mm. Yep, the cleansing of the doors of perception would certainly describe this. But one of the problems of describing it in that particular way is that that tends to bring in its train the notion that what we have to do is to induce a kind of flood of some sort. Clearly, that is what happened. I realized a long time ago, as you know, I wrote a biography of Abraham Maslow. And I wrote the biography of Abraham Maslow because out of the blue, in about 1958, I received a letter from Maslow in which he said that as a psychologist, he got sick of studying sick people because they just talked about their sickness, and he decided instead to find the healthiest people he could find and study them. And what he discovered by studying extremely healthy people was that they all, with great frequency, had what he called peak experiences. These experiences of sudden bubbling, overwhelming happiness. Now, these were not mystical experiences at all. He said that a young mother was watching her husband and children eating breakfast when a beam of sunlight came in through the window and she suddenly thought, my God, aren't I lucky? And went into the peak experience. Now, she was lucky before the beam of sunlight came in through the window, but she didn't know it. The beam of sunlight suddenly made her recognize that she was lucky, and she went into the peak experience. But the peak experience also seems to involve a perception of what you might call difference, duo consciousness. In one case, a marine had been in the South Pacific for several years without seeing a woman. When he went back to base, he saw a nurse and instantly had a peak experience. But he said this was not sexual. It was a sudden amazing recognition that women are different from men. He said his son hit him that this was true. He said normally, you know, we, we accept they're different from men, but we don't really believe it. And that quite suddenly hit him with this terrific force and as it were woke him up. Now, the interesting thing for me was that when Maslow talked about peak experiences to his students, they began remembering peak experiences they'd had in the past and which they'd just more or less forgotten, kind of tossed away. One of them, for example, had been working his way through college as a jazz drummer. And working one morning at two o'clock in the morning, drumming away, he suddenly found that he could not do a thing wrong. He was drumming absolutely perfectly and he went into the peak experience. Now, as soon as the students began remembering their past peak experiences, they began telling them to one another in class, and quite suddenly they all began having peak experiences all the time. As soon as they began to think and talk about peak experiences, they began having peak experiences. Now, obviously, Maslow had found a far better way of inducing the intensity experience than Graham Greene with his Russian roulette. You can do it with your mind alone by turning your mind in this direction. Now, I also began to see that the peak experience um, is also the flow experience. What appears to be happening is that a flow of energy comes out and washes your senses clean, which is the doors of perception. But what the flow experience does basically is, so to speak, straighten you out. Think of your mind as a sort of river carrying, you know, vitality. You find that stuck in the boring necessities of everyday life, very often you begin to feel discouraged. And the river flows slower and slower. And what happens when a river flows slower and slower is it begins to bend and get silted up with the mud it's bringing down. This is the state of many people throughout their lives. Now suddenly, something causes a sort of explosion of, let's say, anger or delight or anything else, and it's like a flash flood from the hills that sends down a terrific quantity of water, straightens out the river, washes out all of the silt, and quite suddenly, once again, you know you're straight and you have this feeling of flowing vitality and are able to induce the flow from then, and from then and on much more easily. Now, there's one problem with this. I've been deeply interested for quite a number of years in serial murderers, 
And I realized at a fairly early stage that this is the basic mechanism of the serial killer. That what he's doing is in fact causing a flash flood by releasing violence, nearly always sexual violence. The flash flood leaves him for, a time, for the time being feeling wonderful and then almost instantly it goes away. And he finds himself back in the same state as before. So there's obviously something very odd about this. Clearly, the flow experience, the flash flood, is not, in a sense, a genuine experience. Otherwise, it would be maintained after it's happened. Why did Graham Greene, after these experiences of Russian roulette, he did it six times in all, and it got more and more boring each time he did it until finally he gave it up simply because he was no longer getting this terrific shot of adrenaline as he pulled the trigger. Why? Each time he was in as great a danger. Obviously what was happening is that he himself was being taken over by a purely mechanical part of himself, the part that caused the problem in the first place. And it was this mechanical part that was the trouble. This mechanical part I call the robot. We've got, uh, I'll come to you in a moment, I promise. Um, we've got a kind of robot inside us which does things for us. You learn, let's say, to type very slowly and painfully and then suddenly the robot takes it over and types twice as fast as you could. You learn to speak, let's say, a foreign language. Quite suddenly the robot takes over and proceeds to speak French for you. And what's more, does it far more efficiently than you could. You're driving home feeling rather tired and suddenly you find your home. Your robot has driven your car and you can't remember driving home. This robot is absolutely wonderful. And the reason that we human beings are the most efficient creatures on the surface of the earth is that our robot is so much more efficient than the robot of dogs and cats. Now, there's only one problem about the robot. He not only does the things we want him to do, he also does the things we don't want him to do particularly when we get tired. So let's say you listen to a symphony that moves you deeply and you feel this is great music. The tenth time you listen, the robot is listening too. <laughs> I personally can no longer listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I know it absolutely perfectly, note by note. The result is that the performance means nothing whatever to me. The robot is in there listening to the symphony. I once said jokingly, I've even caught him making love to my wife. <laughs> and, uh, this is the basic problem of the robot, that he keeps taking over things we don't want him to do. Now obviously when Graham Greene pulled the trigger, the robot gave a shriek of alarm and leapt off his shoulders like the old man of the sea with his legs around Sinbad the sailor's neck. And so if in fact you can get rid of this robot which is sitting on your shoulders, you experience a tremendous sense of freedom. Now you can see that what we're really talking about therefore are methods of temporarily persuading the robot to stop interfering with your everyday consciousness. Steiner was able to do it simply by dropping deep inside himself, leaving the robot up on the surface. And then suddenly this wonderful feeling of ecstasy, happiness, freedom. But there must be other ways of doing this. And again, this is the thing to which I've been devoting my life to try to understand the precise mechanism by which we can get rid of the robot when we like. Now, it struck me that the simplest way of expressing this is as follows. Most of us are something like 50% robot, and we're 50% what you might call real you. And when you're leading a normal, fairly balanced, happy life, you know, let's say spring morning and and you're feeling that the world is good. In point of fact, you're about 51% real you and only 49% robot. And this is the reason that you have this feeling of happiness. Sometimes when you experience a real relief, like green pulling the trigger, then quite suddenly you leap up to about 60% real you and only 40% robot. And there's a feeling of revelation, how magnificent the world is and everything in it. When you begin to get tired, you are suddenly 50-50, 50% real you, 50% robot. And then, if something discourages you or bores you, suddenly you become 
51% robot and only 49% real you. And once this starts, you're in trouble. What you must do is get back to the 50-50 state, if necessary, by sheer willpower. Because once you're in that 49% real you and something bad happens, you tend to think, oh my God, no. And you go into negative feedback and you, you go down to 48% real you. And if ever you get down to, say, 45% real you, you're in really bad trouble. It's almost impossible, unless, you know, something extremely pleasant happens to get back into your normal 50-50 state. Because you're seeing everything so negatively, you're feeling so tired inside, that it's very difficult to get out of this state. Now, you will see that it is apparently a fairly mechanical business. You can also see that when Graham Greene pulled the trigger and did that, he shot up to about 53% real green and only 47% robot. Focusing the attention intently and suddenly enough suddenly shoots you into the real you. Now, this is a fairly simple mechanism. It can actually be done. Later on, when we sort of begin to do some exercises, we'll go on to do what I've always called the pen trick. Uh, all that you do, or that you need for this, is a pen. And you then hold the pen up against a blank wall or a ceiling. And you then focus upon the pen with absolutely everything you've got until you see nothing but the pen and remember nothing but the pen. And when you've really focused your mind to that extent, you suddenly relax and let go. And you should actually have a feeling almost as if you're breathing out with a sense of relief as you do it. As if you've strained the mind in clenching it too close. And then do it again. Focus once again as hard as you can go until it hurts. Then let go. And each time you do this, as you let go, it begins to hurt a little more in the way that your muscles do when you're doing some unaccustomed exercise. You'll find that about the 10th or the 11th time you do this with real attention, it is really beginning to hurt. And when it really begins to hurt, keep going you're there once or twice more and quite suddenly you explode into the peak experience it always works but what you have to do is remember that you are trying to induce mental strain by deliberately focusing upon that pen so hard that there is nothing else in the universe but the pen That total focus places you, as it were, beyond the range of the robot. So here you see you have an extremely simple exercise that always works. <laughs>